as well. You give way to the preface, and that, I think, is, again, consistent with the dissenters. This is about a militia-based right. Um, now then, now, then you look at uh, constitutional history. Okay. So stage one, and um, again, I think when I, when I look at the constitutional history, uh, what I think is the most relevant is you start with 1776. You know, you start with the early bills of rights, then you move forward to the, the, our Constitution, the Bill of Rights. Um, my focus, I mean, I, I can talk in the uh, question and answer uh, about it if, uh, if it comes up, it, but my focus, unlike, say, Scalia's and the majority, is not on English practice prior, because I think it's concerned with a different set of questions and a different constitutional theory. So you look at the first Bill of Rights, um, and most of them, not all of them, but most of them are really concerned about militias. So um, we have Virginia, uh, that a well-regulated militia composed of the body of the people trained to arms is the proper natural and safe defense of a free state, that standing armies in time of peace shall be avoided as dangerous to liberty, and that in all cases the military should be under strict subordination to and governed by the civil power. Okay, the analog is not a right to bear arms uh, in the Virginia Bill of Rights. It's about the militia. Uh, the same is the same we have in Delaware and Maryland. Okay, they're about militias, not about the right to bear arms. Now, then, when we have the right to bear arms, which we have in some of the states, uh, in two of the cases, it it is tied in with defense. Uh, so we've got uh, North Carolina. The people have a right to bear arms for the defense of the state. They have a bear, right to bear arms for the defense of the state. Uh, Massachusetts. The people have a right to keep and to bear arms for the common defense. For the common defense. It's not an individual right. It's not about self-protection. It's about for the common defense. Now, this is the dominant view. The militia-based view is dominant. Now, I would say, you know, it's not everybody's view. And I think one of, you know, one of the things that lawyers have a tendency to do, and historians as well, is when they're arguing for a specific side, they say, everybody thought this. I think there is evidence for the individual right uh, that's a broader right than a militia-based right at, in 1776, and particularly in Pennsylvania. Uh, that the people have a right to bear arms for the defense of themselves and the state, for the defense of themselves. Um, now, Pennsylvania is really considered, if you read, as uh, some of you had, Gordon Wood's Creation of the American Republic, you know, Pennsylvania in a lot of ways is an outlier of the first state constitutions. But I think it does have this text that could be read, there's an argument about it, but it could be read as an individual right that goes beyond the militia base right. That's about self-defense. And Vermont, uh, which is actually not a state, uh, has broken away from uh, uh, New York, that is kind of hopes to be a state someday. Uh, actually, I think if Heller uh, Scalia relies on Vermont, never tells you it's not a state at this point, but it's not. I don't mean to offend any Vermont Vermonters, but it's not. Um, they largely copy <coughs> the Pennsylvania uh, Constitution when they draft their own Bill of Rights. Not totally, but largely. So the bottom line is when you look at 1776, 1777 through 1780, kind of the first period, it's really about militias and it's about common defense, not an individual right of self-protection. Um, fast forward. Um, you know, what happens? The Constitution has a clause on militias to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States, reserving to the states respectively, the appointment of the officers and the authority of training the militia according to the discipline prescribed by Congress. Now, what, what a lot of the anti-federalists, the opponents of the Constitution, are concerned about is that this is a kind of a way for the federal government to essentially gut the state militias. So George Mason, the great anti-federalist, says, uh, the militia may here be destroyed by that method which has been practiced in other parts of the world before. That is, by rendering them useless, by disarming them. Under various pretensions, Congress may neglect to provide for arming and disciplining the militia, 
and the state governments cannot do it, for Congress has the exclusive right to arm them. Okay? And this is really, this is basically, this is a one instance of the overall anti-federalist take which is that the Constitution vests too much power in the federal government and compromises the power of the state. And so when you look at most, again most but not all, of the state proposed Bill of Rights, they resonate with the theme of militias rather than with the, the theme of individual right of self-protection. Um, for example, Virginia, uh, which is the, uh, that the people have a right to keep and bear arms, that a well-regulated militia composed of the body of the people trained arms is the proper, natural, and safe defense of a free state, that standing armies are dangerous to liberty and therefore ought to be avoided as far as the circumstances and protection of the community will admit, and that all cases the military should be under strict subordination to and be governed by the civic power. It's about militias. Um, now again, not all. Uh, New Hampshire... Uh, is the exception. Uh, New Hampshire says, 12th, their proposal. Congress shall never disarm any citizen unless such as are or have been an actual rebellion. So the weight of the anti-federalist concerns is about militias and the protection and preservation of the state militias, with New Hampshire as an outlier. And then, uh, when Madison <coughs> drafts it, uh, he follows here, as he, as he does often, uh, the, the Virginia model. Uh, and so he has, his text is, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, a well-armed and well-regulated militia being the best security of a free country, but no person religiously scrupulous of bearing arms shall be compelled to render military service in person. It's about, as, as actually the conscientious objector clause highlights, it's about participation in the military. Okay. Um, so my time is almost up, but let me just kind of get the basic themes. Uh, first of all, for an originalist, step one is power of the courts, which is limited. Largely deferential in the exercise of judicial review, and this is an area in which courts are, are deferential. Two, dominant background assumption of the first state constitution focuses on a militia-based right. Not always, but the dominant one. The anti-federalist critique is about the power of the federal government vis-a-vis -vis the states, which again is concerned with the protection of the militia. Most of the state proposed amendments look like that, and that's what Madison is trying to do. Okay? All of which supports that on balance, the militia-based approach is the one that has more evidence on its side and then when you add the deference to that in a case of ambiguity, then it becomes totally clear. But frankly, it's clear to that. Okay, thank you. I'll take about uh, two minutes of rebuttal and we'll open up to Q&A. Uh, I have to say, I, I, I completely disagree with this version of history, which uh, I don't believe has, has uh, actual support in the, in the historical record. Uh, I know people disagree about this, but let me briefly uh, go over some points. The anti-federalists were concerned um, about, uh, about certain aspects of the Constitution, and they wanted a Bill of Rights uh, uh, to address those things that they felt uh, needed, needed to be secured. Um, the Federalists, of course, though, won the election. They controlled the first Congress. They got the Constitution ratified. And the Federalists were in charge. And the person in charge, of course, was Madison who is so federalist, he's even the silhouette of the federal society. Uh, he was the, the, the most radical uh, of the federalists, and, uh, and so the Bill of Rights that he wrote was going to be the Bill of Rights, and it was the Bill of Rights, uh, which addressed things that were not going to be controversial. Uh, of course there was a right to free speech, a right to worship, a right against search and seizure, a right to arms. These were not controversial topics. What was controversial? Anything that would alter the structure of the new constitution that had just been ratified. The idea that they went to all this trouble to write the Constitution and then immediately would alter the balance of military power between the state and the federal governments it's laid out in Article 1, Section 8, uh, Clauses 15 and 16, uh, simply uh, defies credulity. And in fact, there is nothing in the historical record, not one statement by anybody, ever, anywhere, announcing once ever a militia concept of the Second Amendment as announced by the, uh, uh, by the dissent.